and willing to show property. Without Although what we fire. did have in Victoria recently is we had the um, the posting, and it was it was a house for sale that had a sex dungeon. How do you write that up properly? Welcome to the latest episode of Over a Pint. This week we're lucky enough to have Tony Joe in town, well, relative in town for the GTA. He made the nice 40 minute Uber up to my place. We're very thankful to have him up. If you don't know Tony, uh, well, why don't you introduce yourself because I won't do you justice. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I hail from Victoria, British Columbia. So I'm, I'm from way the other side of the country. Uh, I get over here uh, somewhat often, which is nice. I get to visit and stuff like that. Uh, I have been selling real estate for 20, coming up in 28 years. So 90, 91. 91, yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, I spent some time in organized real estate as a director of our real estate board. I was the president in 2008. Uh, after that, I became involved in um, our provincial association. So I'm an instructor. I teach uh, uh, new licensees and for our um, uh, mandatory education. Um, I have a team. So there's uh, we have three licenses and three admin staff. Yeah, I met one of them in Boston. Uh, yeah, Kyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. President. So <laughs> Kyle is the current president of the Real State Board. I was the president back in 2008. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's actually, he was here as well uh, for this trip too, but he just left uh, a little earlier, so. Yeah, that's fun. All right, so this week we're not doing beer. We're actually mixing it up a little. Uh-huh. So we're gonna actually try a J.P. Weiser's pre-made Old Fashioned, and I'm not gonna put it too much on the screen because Facebook will actually disallow if they think it's an ad for alcohol. Oh, interesting. So I'll allow you to judge your I'm own very curious you're... about this because I like Old Fashions and yeah. having a pre, uh, pre-mix. pre Yeah. Yeah, but the ice looks very interesting here. Yeah, so this is, and one of my favorites, because we also have both gotten to know each other because we're both geeks. Um, it's Han Solo frozen in kryptonite ice. Carbonite. Ice. Carbonite. But you, kryptonite. Brett Coulter watches this, you know, yeah. you gotta get that right, eh? That's true. Yeah. I will get called out on that, I'm yes. sure, by more than one person. So the Han Solo carbonite. ice cubes. Yeah. yeah. We also have Death Star Spears, but they're currently, actually, I got those from a client of mine when I was selling. Nice. So he's from Hong Kong. Okay. And he's just, anytime he sees something, he just messages like, someone in his family over there and he's like oh i always have someone who's like works the factory that gets these i'll just get them super cheap yes. so i was like he's like i'm ordering these and they're gonna be a buck each he's like do you want a couple and i was like yes i do awesome. <laughs> so awesome. i got a couple of these death star ice spheres for a dollar each. Uh, so i could have checked this out yeah. cheers let me know what you think All right. i love old fashions for pre-made it's got the sweet the yeah, it's all right. Yeah, that's way better than the other pre-mades I've tried. Uh, uh, you know what? Actually, I gotta say, that is that is uh, scarily convenient. Yeah. And JP Wiser is not paying us to say that, but if they'd like to send either of us money for this review, I'm sure we would both accept it. Yeah, I, I gotta say, this this beats making the simple sugar, uh, simple yeah. Uh, sugar and uh, yeah. And it, where this would work well is a lot of those bars that they don't know how to make them. Yeah. Because a bad old fashioned. Yeah. Like it's rough. Or you go crazy with the bitters yeah. or something. No, like it's, I, a, it's all right. I was at a summit last week and I went to like the lobby bar after and I'm like, can I grab an old fashioned? And I almost unordered it when she goes, what's in that again? Oh God. And I was immediately like, I was like, oh, I was like, oh wait, I remember. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I almost been like, no, it's okay. I'll just have a whiskey. Yeah. And she came back and it was like a ruby red drink. Oh my. And I tried well, it was, to, oh, with the old fashioned, you mean? Yeah. Well, because she went crazy with the bitters. Yeah, oh, and yeah. it was not good. All right. <laughs> so, I'm always, there's the best one I ever had was in the Shangri La in Toronto. That best one, one I've ever had, actually, wasn't truly an old fashioned, mm -hmm. was in uh, Dallas. And it was a um, uh, uh, Jameson's Black Label Irish whiskey. Interesting. That's great. I have since been making those at home. So. I've never thought of trying it with Jameson's. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be an interesting one to test. Yeah. So I, I, I had a buddy over yeah. and we were, we were having some and he goes, you know, it's not called an old fashioned <laughs> if it's not, you know, whiskey. So, yeah, yeah. Normally it's like Magic Maker or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. So you've been in real estate since 91. Yes. 
How did you like get started? Like, what made you want to get into the industry? <clears throat> I fell into it because I was young, right? Mm -hmm. um, I uh, so after high school, I, I had intended to become an architect. Yeah. And uh, I took uh, um, some architectural courses in, in high school, um, and I ended up taking a break. So I took a year off uh, before applying to university. Yeah. And it was, it was in Victoria. In Victoria. Yeah. yeah. And it was that year that I started, uh, I was working at the keg, so mm -hmm. I was working at the restaurant and uh, um, just started to end up having some fun, right? But then I needed something, you know, feeling a little more grown up, so I ended up selling cars. So I sold Hondas for a while. Yep. And, um, you know, because I'm a car guy. Uh, but uh, the good thing was I was not good at that job, <laughs> right? So, yeah. the, you know, lead conversion, fall, like all these things that we do in the real estate business, which they do in the car business as well, too. It's um, different, though, because it's like they come on the lot and then there's... There are ups that come on the yeah. lot, that's true. But you still got, you know, it's yeah. the whole rapport building yeah. and, and selling, right? And my problem in the car business was that I like cars. And, you know, Hondas, are, they were great. This is 1988 yeah. we're talking about here, right? Yeah. I was selling cars. And, um, but for instance, if somebody came in to look at the Prelude, yeah. but I liked the Celica GTS, which was the four wheel drive one in the Toyota lot next door, <laughs> I would, I'd say, well, you know, you should go buy that car, <laughs> but I can't sell it to you because yeah. all we have is Honda, right? So you should have been the buyer rep for the If car they had people. such a thing, yeah. yes. Yeah, and actually, New opening. <laughs> and uh, brokers were coming out at that time, car brokers. Yeah. Uh, and that, that would have been great. And what, um, one day, because one of the things about car lots is the service department. So the car, the car lot makes all the money in the service department. People go back for servicing. When they're in getting their car service, they're hanging out and checking out new cars. So, you know, there's that whole cycle, right? And I met a realtor. And I was um, 18, 19 years old. And I was in a suit all the time. Because you have to when you're young, right? Yeah. Uh, and the realtor, he just said, he goes, hey, you should think about real estate. <laughs> And I, it sort of interesting, interested me, but it was strange because my parents lived in the same house for 60 years, yeah. right? So moving was not in our, in our family makeup. I had no idea what it was like. Thought it was cool because, you know, as a kid, you figure, you, you know, all these expensive sales and stuff, you'd make lots of money. I was in the commission business already, yep. right? So you're used to it? Yeah. Uh, and I ended up responding to an ad, a C21 ad. <laughs> Uh, and took courses, and I got licensed in uh, was about 1990 that I started taking my my. So did you end up starting with C21 after you went through it all? No, so I, I did the C21 courses, yeah. you know, the pre uh, exam courses, yeah. uh, and uh, this gal that I had met who was taking the course as well, she had gone and done her shopping. So she goes, mm -hmm. we should go to this local brokerage because yeah. you know the desk fees are low and it's a hundred percent house and all that stuff, and and uh, I followed her. Uh, it was funny because I got, we needed 60% to pass back then. Okay. What's it here? I think it was 75 when I was taking Holy it. Holy cow. So that was six years ago, I think. Oh yeah. It was 75% to pass. So right now in British Columbia, it's 70. Mm -hmm. Back then it was 60. I got 62. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget, I was working at the keg, <laughs> drinking old fashioned. Yeah. Right? Um, just snuck in. Just snuck in, which is fine, right? right? So she got, her name was Tanya, she got 96% or something. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting because, you know, I, I remember having a conversation with her. She's like, I got 96%. I'm going to be, I'm going to be an awesome realtor. That's <laughs> yeah, a great indicator of future success. In real yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah pass the exam that has not percent range realtor. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, you know, you, she, so she basically aced an exam that has no relevance to actually sell real estate. Yeah. Well, that was mine. I think I got 98% in the first one, the first exam. A yep. couple of them I got 100. Yep. Well, okay. And, like, it was, they were jokes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> so, yeah, no. Um, actually, there's a pretty high failure rate in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I ended up uh, getting into the business, going to this uh, local company. Mm -hmm. uh, precursor, because, you know, with early days of the 100% houses, right? Yeah. And uh, I was there for... So that was really a Remax pioneered thing at the time, wasn't it? Like, well, or popularized, I guess, would be the better. Well, Remax came because uh, Remax was a little later in Victoria. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was interesting. And mm -hmm. I was working with a partner at the time. We had just spent $3,000 on stationery. 
<laughs> you know, business cards, because nobody did that back then, right? Yeah. So we had this cool marketing stuff, and uh, I showed her the business card, and she says, you know, it would look a lot nicer if there was a Remax balloon on it. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, damn it. So we moved to Remax. <laughs> uh, I was a year and a half into the business. Another 3,000. And uh... I chucked in the fire, actually, because it was wintertime, so we had yeah. a fire going on. That was, Do you that need, was... one, need a fire in Victoria? Yeah, 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 it's more for show. It's all for show. Yeah, it's all for show. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, no. So been uh, at Remax uh, ever since. You've got like lifetime achievement or Hall of Fame with Remax. Hall of now. Fame lifetime achievement as well. Yeah, yeah Diamond uh, uh, Team Award. So what's all the the only thing left? Circle of Legends. Or? It's coming. Yeah, so I'm right about. Uh, I looked at the stats because the stats are all on the yeah. on uh, Max Center now. So I think. I'm gonna say I'm about a year and a bit away from the from the big the the final yeah, yes from yeah. the the beast. I've seen that thing. It's quite hefty. So like you are like from like an organized real estate like the volunteering side of it. Mm -hmm. One of the most involved. Like it'd be like you're up there with like you know where like Richard Silver is. Like those people just like at everything. You see them. At you everything. had Richard Silver on your show. I yes. did. Yeah. yeah. How long into your business until yeah. you started getting into that world? Uh, great question. So I was 10 years in mm -hmm. and I remember asking a, a friend of mine about, um, you know, what do I got to do to volunteer at the real estate board? Because I knew nothing about the board structure or anything. Uh, and all of a sudden I got a phone call from the nominating committee looking for new directors. Because at the time they had a slate of directors that was really controversial. So they were looking to sort of clean the slate off. Yeah. So they ended up um, asking myself and... Uh, three others uh, to join the board. And uh, it's funny because when I, on my nomination form, I was the only candidate that had no experience. So there's yeah. no, like no committees, no nothing. I hadn't, I hadn't done anything, right? All I did was sell real estate for 10 years. Um, I was always a hundred percenter. In fact, even by then I was a platinum uh, guy yeah. uh, uh, way back then. And I just, it, it, it interested me to get involved and I did. And I was shy. I knew nothing about. Uh, you were shy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, because you know, you're 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 around a board yeah. table, and you know, executive officer, staff. Mm -hmm. You've got you, you know uh, people with a lot of board experience. I was just I was quiet. Yeah. They said I was really quiet my first two years. <laughs> um, but I ended up getting reelected twice. So I yeah. spent three terms, and uh, I was the president back in two thousand and eight. So. How have you found like it? Because you were ten years before you got into it. It's a pretty like long time to establish yourself, your routine, yep. and kind of like a lot of people then just take that method, go the rest of their career that way. Mm -hmm. How do you found like has your business changed and how you operate since you got involved in volunteering? Yeah, so I, I think the main thing is by being on the board. I started going to a lot of conferences because you know how boards go at leadership conferences, NAR, yeah. right? Uh, Banff Western uh, Connection, all these great conferences. Um, I started going to those and I started becoming a, 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 a conference junkie. Yeah. Right? Because I went to some sales things when I was early. I went to uh, Roger Butcher, was the name of the guy. I think I saw him in like 1993. You don't know what happened to him. Never heard of him. Okay. <laughs> I listened to Jerry Bresser. You know Jerry yeah, Bresser? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I had the cassette tape, so I listened to them in the car, right? Um, but I had never really done anything. I started going to all these conferences. NAR was really inspirational because all of the speakers are there, mm -hmm. right? The Sanford and the David Knox and yeah. um, Fairies and, and Buffini, right? Yeah. Um, and I, as a result of that, I ended up going to Richard Robbins in 2002 yeah. in Vancouver. Because back then he was doing Vancouver, Calgary, uh, Toronto. Yeah. And I got to say that was probably the biggest change um, because it, it it caused me to start thinking about real estate as a, as a business because nobody back then nobody ever talked about business plans and about goal setting and about all that stuff and it's it's been that's the reason why I'm here now of course is yeah. for the, well, so, the like, so you do all the volunteering you have a successful business like you guys are one of the top teams like I see you guys like some like top in the brokerage sometimes type mm -hmm. of thing. Then you also decided to become a coach for Richard Robbins just to add to that? How did that, like, how do you, like, one, it's talk about that, but then okay. the sheer time management of all these balls you're juggling in the air. Okay, well, there's more to the story, actually. So, yeah. because um, uh, I spent time uh, as the president, mm -hmm. and uh, because my predecessor didn't do any media time, she was afraid of the camera. I ended up doing media training, so I had my year yeah. and her year before, 
And then the president afterwards, often I had to fill in for as well too. So I basically had three years worth of, of media time. And as a result, I started getting known in the community. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, when my board time was up, because you know, you're the president and you're the past president, I um, was kind of wondering, you know, I, I was interested to do more non-real estate community related stuff. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the, the phone started ringing because, you know, if boards and committees for organizations in any town are always looking for very capable people, ideally people that have board experience or have committee experience of some sort. And I ended up um, becoming the co-chair of the Greater Victoria Coalition to End Homelessness. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, um, you know, it's, it's the pe that was back in 2009, right? So there's still friends and people that, that I know. It's very interesting when you think about it because to be in the, the real estate business, but to be doing things that have absolutely nothing to do directly with real estate. Sure, there's the, the you know uh, properties and things like that, but the clientele is not yeah. real estate buying, right? Uh, Victoria has a chronic homelessness problem. We're an expensive uh, marketplace. Uh, mental mental um, health um, and addictions, you know, those are issues that happen, I guess, in, in any town. Now, do you get more homelessness there because it's kind of like a weather-friendly place if you're in Canada? Like, is that one of the... One of the jobs that we had was to dispel the myth because a lot of people feel, oh, you know, they jump, uh, these poor people jump in a bus in Calgary and come yeah. to Victoria because the weather's good. It's not true. We did, we did so many surveys. Most of our homelessness population is homegrown. Right, uh, and it has just gotten worse since then because of the cost of real estate. We didn't build uh, mm -hmm. purpose-built rental buildings in Victoria for 25 years. Wow, not a single one, right? So, do you have a lot of rentals now? Well, there have been new rentals that have been built in the past couple of years, mm -hmm. um, but you know that's another thing too because all of the new build rentals are expensive. Yeah, because they're you know the new stuff, the stainless steel and the you know granite counters. So you know you're getting a one bedroom. Uh, um, apartment for sixteen, seventeen hundred bucks a month, which is expensive in Victoria, right? Yeah. Where Toronto that'd be like twenty five hundred. Probably, right, right? I mean it's a little nuts here right now. Yes. But. <laughs> yes. Um but uh you know on welfare people get about three hundred and seventy five dollars for housing allowance, right? Yeah. So the gap between three seventy five and, and sixteen hundred people go, you know this new stuff is ridiculous because it's sixteen hundred bucks, but that was never the point. The yeah. point is the new developments cause people to move upwards from the lower priced ones and there's this whole housing continuum, right? Yeah. Uh, so things have helped a little bit. But I got very heavily involved in, in homelessness. Um, uh, again, like I said, it's not, there's no prospecting there because, yeah. you know, this is not clientele. But what it really did was it got me further uh, uh, entwined in the community, right? Yeah. So getting to know the heads of like the United Way and um, mustard seed and you know all the other uh, um, uh, big organizations too to the point where I, I, I typically spend about half of my work week in um, in organization and does that work. indirectly lead to a lot of business like referrals from those heads of those organizations and things like that uh, that's a yes no answer <laughs> that's a yes no answer yeah. so because here's the thing I, I, I learned kind of early on that it would be wrong to be involved in these things for the idea of prospecting. Yeah. Right? So I gave them my time and my knowledge and my connections, which is what you're supposed to do, right? And uh, as it turns out, you know, things just, things kind of happen. Now, um, that board in particular, uh, people kind of made it clear to me. They'd say, oh, you know, um, so Anne is, a, is a, a lady who's a dear friend now that I got to meet there. She said, um, yeah, my good friend, you know, my realtor whenever I need a realtor is Karen. Right, so they, they make it clear that I'm not gonna be Anne's realtor, right? Yeah. But the funny thing is Anne had somebody, it was like, oh, I've got a friend whose uh, daughter is looking for a place and I gave you their name. So it was an indirect, right? Yeah. And I, you know, that's great. So how many different like volunteer organizations outside of the real estate industry have you been involved in now? A lot. So there was like a hospice one in there for yeah. a bit and a few others. Yeah, so I, um, I, I, guess, I guess the First one was Rotary, mm -hmm. so I was a um, one of the um, a founding member of a Rotary chapter in 2004. I'm still a Rotarian. Uh, I'm a Knight of Columbus, which is through the Catholic Church. Uh, actually, I've been that since I was 18. Um, uh, since then, I've become an Odd Fellow. You know what the Odd Fellows? We actually have a chapter in Aurora, or I guess from New York now, but in Aurora there was one. Yeah. But. 
at Terra, so like they, they did like one of those chamber of commerce, everyone come see what we're doing. Yeah. And every member that was there, none of them actually lived in Aurora, but they still had a rent on the place and they didn't want to give it up because it was a really good spot. Yeah. So they just did meet, they took like all the surrounding ones and they just used it as a central meeting spot, but they actually had no living Aurora members because they all passed away. Oh yeah, they aged out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And well, like, this is actually the funny thing of the group here. I don't know if it's like that. Oh, it definitely isn't because you're already under the age of what this group was is they were talking to me about like trying to get me to join like we need some young blood we had another young guy who just joined yeah. and they kept going on about this other young guy who just joined and why i should join too and at one point like 10 minutes later under i'm just talking to this other guy and we were talking about how he just retired he was so happy like finally retired after 35 years in his business and we're just going on I'm like that's awesome like and how young was he like he looked like a retiree like okay. he was not like <laughs> yeah. he wasn't like going into a home soon thing but he like you could tell he had worked 35 years a hard job yeah. and was now retired and the members came up and they're like this is the guy we were talking about the young guy who just joined yeah. and i'm like there's a big gap here well, it's funny because, you know, our Odd Fellows uh, chapter in Victoria, mm -hmm. which owns a fantastic property downtown, yeah. nobody knows it's there. Like, yeah. it's this huge property. And uh, when I first joined, it was uh, it was kind of sad to see because it was almost all uh, octogenarians. Like, they were, they, were, they were getting along. But now it's become younger. It's a, it's a very vibrant group. There's the Rebecca's as well, too, who are the, you know, the, um, the females. There's groups, actually, of men, men and women, too. Yeah, they just announced... Because they need, they actually said because we needed more members, we've invited women in. Yeah. And then one of the pitches to join the group was, we'll also pay for your funeral. Well, and I'm like, we just get. I feel like I'm not old enough. Should be a real estate kind of yeah. thing like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just, it was a really funny experience going to that and being like, and then hearing you're in it because like literally you would have been 30 years younger than mm -hmm. probably anyone else that would have been at the one here. Yeah, actually, the Odd Fellows is really interesting because it's, it's a vibrant group in Victoria. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, um, uh, clients of mine who are both, both him and her involved in the Odd yeah. Fellows chapter moved from Newmarket. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so mm -hmm. I was familiar with, with the area. Um, but anyways, getting back, uh, yeah, so Odd Fellows, um, I, you know, the interesting thing is when you start getting involved in boards, you start getting asked to be on boards more. Uh, so, uh, hospice, I ended up serving on the hospice board for a couple of years. Uh, the board that I'm on right now that I gave up hospice for is the TELUS community board. So what's actually involved in being on a board? Cause like you see sometimes people who are on like five different boards at a time and all these different things. Like what, what's the level of commitment? What's like the responsibilities? Yeah, it really depends. So, <laughs> you know, when I took on the job of the, uh, uh, as co-chair for the Greater Victoria Coalition and Homelessness, mm -hmm. my role was as the business representative. Yeah. The other co-chair was the mayor. So I sat with the mayor of Victoria, yeah. uh, which is great because I got to know him very well. We had meetings every Monday morning, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, I ended up also overseeing the executive officer. So I had to do the review, like her, her, yeah. uh, review and all that. So it was a lot of work for the years that I was there. Uh, I, I think now when I look back, knowing now what I, what I know, I, I am now more, um, I do more research before I agree to a, uh, to a, to a board organization. Uh, especially, you know, we don't have a ton of time, right? Yeah. Um, I, on one hand, I, it's nice to give right checks, you know, to, to, to be charitable. I think that we need to be more involved, right? Yeah, and time has more value. Time has a lot money. of value. You know, you, you look at anyone, Richard, for instance, is very busy, right? On a, on a, on a per hour basis, when we do the math, it's a huge donation, right? Yeah. The time that we give uh, into, into organized things. But, you know, there are some boards that require the board to basically do all the heavy lifting, right? Yeah. And um, again, if, if someone's got the time to do that, they have the passion, uh, that's not a bad thing. Right. Uh, I just stepped down as the president of the Asian Real Estate Association's Vancouver chapter. Yeah. So Richard was in that Toronto chapter, right? Um, so I've sat there for three years. It was kind of interesting because I'm from Victoria, mm -hmm. but I was the only person that could step into the chair role because I had board experience, uh, and they were they were looking for someone Asian. Uh, my my replacement who just stepped in is not Asian, so it's not a prerequisite. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, you know, there's something to be said about the board experience. So right now, that Asian Real Estate Association of Vancouver has me, past president of Vancouver Board, of Victoria Board, 
uh, the current president is the past president of the Fraser Valley Board, mm -hmm. and uh, the vice president and the commercial head are also past presidents of the Fraser Valley Real Estate Board. So there's a lot of a lot of great experience. So it's an interesting one because like you've been on that board, and I know like especially in the, like BC was the first to bring in like the foreign buyers tax. Like yeah. that's in the news a lot. You're on TV a lot. Yeah. And we've talked about it before, like off camera, how you were almost like blamed for all the Asian money coming True. in. True. Yeah. How is that being like, because I know like agents generally are blamed for rising price and all that. How is it different like when it's like you personally being blamed in public for like the fault for a lot of the stuff going on? Oh, yeah. Okay. So so the, the, the story there is I, I did some marketing. So I sent a mailer out mm -hmm. to key areas, you know, be kind of like the Markham of Victoria, right? Yeah. Uh, because I, I had a team member who was Chinese. Mm -hmm. We dealt with a lot of Chinese business. You know, remembering now, this is uh, like 2013, 2014, yeah. right? And we were basically saying that uh, if you want to sell your home, we have contacts uh, in China, we can help you. Um, so anyways, the news got a hold of this. And uh, it's on my YouTube channel because I've, <laughs> I've, I've uh, posted them there. But the media basically was, was gruesome. So people were saying, oh, this is a real estate guy, you know, he's, he's single-handedly driving up <laughs> property values. You know, it's not right that all these foreign people should be coming in and blah, 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 blah. And um, it, was, it was hard because I, I was in Vancouver on a family holiday and my Twitter feed blew up because all these people were posting about how evil I am. Yeah. And um, uh, I made the comment in the, the news about how home sellers typically don't care yeah. where the buyer is coming from if the money is high enough yeah. right ever. no yeah. one's ever like i'm going to take less to sell exactly yeah right so anyways i i i you know i've got that as a sound bite out there in the uh uh on tv of course all these people are saying how dare you blame sellers you know yeah. it's you who's bringing these people <laughs> in and all this stuff and uh, my thick skin grew pretty quick because I got to tell you, I, I always say that was a three hundred thousand dollar flyer. Yeah. Because that flyer generated for us in just over a year three hundred thousand dollars. Well, that would be like yeah, like people reaching out like I want that money. Yeah. Like, yeah. There's the downside of the negative publicity, but there'd be every homeowner's like, yeah, he's got the money. Yes. I'm coming to him. So of course now. <laughs> so not the first episode she's been on. <laughs> All right. Uh, now so. Timing is everything because it goes without saying we're not sending that flyer out now. Yeah, like it's just too hot right now in the the realm of foreign buyers, yeah. uh, particularly in Vancouver. But yeah, no, that was that was interesting. Yeah. yeah. So how like did you find any? Obviously, three hundred thousand is great. Were there any like long term negative impacts from that that you found from the like, going basically viral like that? No. Mm -hmm. No, because oh, here's another one because. I had somebody, uh, it was Twitter or something, it, may, it was Twitter, mm -hmm. somebody commented something about you are a greedy real estate agent, you have no idea about the struggles that people go through. No. And, I, and Bruce Johnson actually was the guy at the time, he said, you know what, don't respond to any of that negative stuff. Yeah. So I, I didn't pay attention until that one. And I just, I blew up and I responded, I said, hey listen. Uh, I chaired the Greater Victoria Coalition in Homelessness. I spent days and afternoons on the street with people. I know people's yeah. struggles. I met a guy who was my age who lived on the street since he was 17. Yeah. Like, I know the problem with homelessness. I have contributed, you know, uh, personal money. I have um, worked with the governments, right, on this topic. So, yeah. you know, if you're saying that I know th nothing about this, well, you should actually have a look at my background. Yeah. And the funny thing is, he responded back, yeah. and he said, "Oh my goodness, I had no idea. Uh, I had, I, I've since checked you out, and yeah. you seem like a nice guy." <laughs> he said, "Yeah." Well, that's the funny thing. It's there's actually a lot there of responding to those people. Yeah. If you have something like, I was actually just posted in my group today, like the wheelhouse one of like, someone commented because it was a post around. We're doing a first time homebuyer seminar. We'll show you how you can own a home for as little as nine hundred a month. Mm -hmm. And someone's like, yeah, if you want to live in a closet. And his response was not like rude or anything. He just literally responded, he's like, no, actually you can. Like I recently put a buyer in for this and then she got a purchase press improvement loan and did that. And like, 
Then we got a tenant in her basement for the two bedroom basement apartment. There we are ways to do it. And like, yeah. and then she has someone in another room paying this much. And she's 25 years old, owns her own place at 25. And here's how she got a $900 carrying cost. Boom. And it had more likes than any other comment in the entire thread. Yeah. And as a reply, and I'm like, that's how you do it. Yeah. Like, it just be calm and give them the real life. And you know, I mean, haters got to yeah. hate, right? Yeah, so there's some guys you can't. Yeah, but that that was it. But you know, as as, as far as long term negatives, no, not really, because yeah. you know, I think if you know who you are, mm -hmm. right, and if you and if 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 you get the sense that your values are are yeah. are are fine, then whatever. Like, I'm, we're not out to scam anyone, yeah. right? I mean, all of these people that hired us as a result of the flyer were very happy with their result. So, I mean, how, how can we argue with that? Right? Plus, you actually have to, you have the fiduciary duty to get them as much money as you can. Like, yeah. you have to do it. <laughs> yeah. If a realtor was ever to say, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, um, in the interest of the community at large, yeah. you should actually take less. Yeah. So I'd rather that, you sell to this white person. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that would not go well in the media either. Oh, you. <laughs> yeah, she's a big suck. Yes. And apparently, we don't give her enough attention. Uh huh. <laughs> So here's a, it's like you probably go to more conferences than the like ninety nine percent of people in the industry. Like yeah. like I go to a lot of them. You go like and there's like yeah there's Richard who goes to a ton too. Like where do you see the value? Because like if you go to enough conferences, it's the same speakers, it's the same content. There's rarely yep. new information. So where do you see the value in all these conferences? Well, hey, a great example was the most recent uh, Remax Recharge that was in Vaughn uh, mm -hmm. a couple months ago. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't find, you know, I'm sure people did. I didn't find that the content was very, was, what well, it didn't speak to me. Yeah. Um, but was the visit a success? Yes, it was because yeah. it's bumping into people. It's the networks and the connections that we make over time, right? And um, it's it's really important to be there all the time. Just yeah. you know, keeping up those uh, those contacts. Right? Do you make a point of like coming early to do networking and then staying a little later? Because well, like I know a lot of people who like if the conference was just today, yeah. they'd like fly in late last night, get to the hotel, get up, go to the conference, and be the first one out the door and get back on the plane and go. Yeah. Like, where do you feel in, like, booking time around the conference? Well, it's funny, you know, because since since we're in Victoria, mm -hmm. sometimes that decision is based on travel, right? Yeah. Because, you know, unlike most, like a whole bunch of guys just left for Vancouver because they got a direct flight, you know, five to whatever, right? Yeah. It's a little harder for, for us because we got another leg to go, right? Because um, there's not a lot of direct flights. Yeah. So sometimes that's the decision. I, I don't purposely um, do that. It kind of depends on where it is, too, right? So if I'm going to NAR and it's New Orleans or it's something, I'll spend a day on either side and okay. check things out. Um, as much as I love Toronto, I get a fair amount of Toronto. I don't. <laughs> You're here a few times a year. Yeah, there's no extra. Like, yeah. I don't need that extra <laughs> Toronto. It's yeah. Uh, yeah, it's all good. And how have you found networking? Because like obviously being literally on an island. Yep. How do you find like Facebook has helped the networking or oh, other yeah. social media like that with agents yeah. specifically? So it's funny that you bring that up because I was thinking about it today. You know, you go to a conference, you get business cards. All of a sudden, you get all these people that are friending you, friending you on Facebook, yeah. and and you've got these people. Two years later, you go, "Who the heck is this guy?" Oh yeah, that's right. I met him at the, yeah. you know some conference in Hawaii or something, right? Um, and it, it reminded me this conference because I, I had met so many people yeah. and we were Facebook friends, but to put that, the, you know, the face to the name, mm -hmm. uh, it sort of, it, it cements, it cements that yeah. connection, right? Yeah, well, it's funny too, because like, I know at least like speaking at conferences, people like, when, like you must see this as a speaker, you speak an event, you get a barrage of friend yes. requests every time. Yeah. It doesn't mean you remember them. Yeah. Because you'll they were in the audience. a thousand people in the audience. Yeah. Then you'll go to another conference and they'll speak to you like you're best friends. Yeah. How do you actually deal like, because like you must go to those where people come up talking to you like you almost should know who they are. Yeah. yeah. What's your, like, how do you respond to those people who come up like <laughs> acting like they know exactly who you are and you have no clue who they okay, are? Okay, I got to say, I've only recently been better at this because I was bad I'm before. Bad Right, and so my wife and I, because my wife, uh, she's also in real estate. She's a coach for Richard Robbins now, um, and our kids are young, so we haven't been conferencing together. Yeah. But in the time, I don't think I've ever met her. No, no, I don't think so. No. Um, but in the times that we do conference, we got it set up where that for each other, we we you know the cue of your spouse. Yeah. When you go, okay, she doesn't know who this is, so I jump in and go, hey, I'm Tony, and your name yeah. is, yeah. and then that you know that. Yeah, I've actually got my wife trained. 
Train's maybe not the right word, but basically I have her trained to do that when she's with me. Yes. Is that she has to introduce herself before they have that a chance is a to say anything. Yes. But she actually doesn't like coming to real estate conferences because she's found the second she, like, they realize she's not in the business because she's a parole officer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just don't care about her anymore. Interesting. Like, she's like, yeah, hey, I went to an event. There's about 90 agents there. Literally the second to every single one that I mentioned I wasn't in real estate, it was just like, all right, she could be like, you could tell they're just like, all right, when can I get out of this to go to the next conversation? And she's, so she doesn't actually like coming to the conferences anymore. Yeah, well. <laughs> um, but so, I've, so now I have like the people on my team because yeah. they come to conferences with me. I'm like, well, you just jump in and introduce yeah. yourself right away. So, just and, in case. so that was our, that was our go-to, but, no. um, but I've been better recently mm -hmm. at being able to say, you know, I'm sorry, I can't, I, I think I should know you. Yeah. Um, do we meet before? Whatever, and, and let the conversation sort of pick up. Yeah. Uh, and then sometimes it comes up. Well, we've never met, but I saw you speak, and I yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. So I, I never say like nice to see you again yeah. or meet you. Like I always just be like, hey, how's it going? Like yeah. I just try to like, and then hopefully they bring it up. Yeah. Although actually, this is funny. The worst experience I've ever had in this, which is probably, and I still apologize to her this day for it. Um, Nick Perfetta. Oh, yeah. I was going out with him and his wife. Yeah, yeah. Heather, yeah. yeah. And we were sitting, like, we rode in a cab. It's so actually, I think it was Next Gen RE in Vancouver. Oh, interesting. And we were all in the cab, and, like, I'd never met Nick before. I'd never met him. Oh, that was at the, the Metropolitan Hotel. Yeah. Right. And so we all get in this cab together, but I'm sitting in the middle like this. Yeah. And I got Nick and Heather on either side of me. Yeah. And so when you're talking in the middle like this, and I'm a big guy, so sitting in the middle, like, I'm literally like this. You can't really turn. Mm -hmm. We're talking, so I never actually looked like at her face because I'm like this. And then we get to this networking event, everyone piles out of the cab and kind of blends into the crowd. Like five minutes later, I run into her, I'm like, hey, I'm Andrew. <laughs> and she's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh no. And yeah, she's like, yeah. we just rode in the car together yeah. for 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> like, that to me is the worst experience I've had. That's pretty bad. Yeah. That's pretty bad. Uh, I yeah, still, yeah, like, yeah. Three, three years later, <laughs> I apologize to her every time I see her. <laughs> That's feel bad about that one. Yeah, that was a funny one. Yeah. But yeah, no, conferences, yeah. Uh, man, they are. So there was a point in time where numbers were down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I had a team meeting. Did you more? Yeah. Ice? Uh, whatever. All right, well, why don't you pour? I'll grab the ice. All right. And we'll, we'll tag team it that way. All right. So I, I got to say, I'm not unhappy with this. It's good. Yes. Like for, especially for pre mixed, which is rare. Yeah. It gets the job done. It's a good thing that uh, Uber is here because it means not having to drive. It comes in handy. Have you noticed okay. the cufflinks, by the way? That is some, those are nice. So these are Batman cufflinks. You can't that really is see awesome. them. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's nice. So, yeah, so we're going to lure it up. You know? yeah. yeah. So we're actually in a group together called the League of Real Estate Geeks, which is a group of agents that, well, we're geeks, yeah. and there's a league of us. And it's it's one we all specialize. We got we got yeah. certain we specialize in certain areas. Yeah, because like there's like I could never compare to like your level of Star Trek. No one in the group seems to care about Wheel of Time like I do. <laughs> no one can go to Brett against Star Wars. That came up a while ago though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, there's yeah, there's a whole threat because they're starting a TV show. Yes. Yeah, the yeah. problem though is like so like you look at Game of Thrones. Yeah. What was that like four books now? It's going to be six books long. Yeah. Which is funny because I'm not a Game of Thrones guy. I have not yeah. picked that up yet. Lord of the Rings, three books? Yeah, yeah. Wheel of Time's 14 books. Oh, yeah. And each one minimum is about 700 pages. Okay. There's almost 2 million words in the series. It and could never be done right. It's being done in a TV show. Amazon's picking up the bill. Okay. So everyone's kind of like, every fan of the show is like, this is either going to be great yeah. or the worst thing ever. You know, I love that group. I just, I love that group because it's a, it's a, it's a very diverse group. Yeah. Right, sure. so we got the cosplay and the anime, which oh, I'm yeah. not into at all. Yeah, and then there's yeah. and then you know I, I I happen to like movie soundtracks. So you know, in my office, I normally have in the background mm -hmm. movie soundtracks, and um, Jeremy likes you know. Yeah. So we share <laughs> soundtrack stuff, and and uh, yeah, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's, it's just like it's a good, it's a really like wide mix of fandoms in there. Yeah. And yeah, a good but nobody paper. else likes my red dwarf though. They're, I can't get me to pick up on the red dwarf. I've never seen it. Oh, uh, okay. Well, that's all right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe one day. I'll get on the list. Of, but to that end, I've also never seen the entirety original Star Trek. 
Okay. Well, that's okay because there's a lot. That's a big yeah. investment. But like, start seventy nine episodes. Yeah. It is. Yes. I it was shorter than that. Yeah. No. But like it entirety twice at least the next generation. So it was seventy nine episodes, and I think it was something like you need eighty five in order to syndicate or something. Yeah. Um. So that was that whole. That's the reason why the actors all angry because they didn't get their you know yeah. their residual pay. So I mean, not really real at all. Yeah. As an overall series. Yes. Original or next generation. Oh man, you can't ask that question. That's <laughs> tough. Uh, you know, some nights you feel like a ribeye, and some nights you feel like a tenderloin. You know, <laughs> right? Because um, on both series, there's good episodes and bad. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not going back to Spock's brain, right? Like that okay. is that's all. And there's some bad stuff in Next Generation yeah. too. Oh yeah, there's some rough episodes. Yeah, um, I you know because I was raised with Star Trek. It yeah. was Saturdays on KVOS in Seattle. Um, uh, it's, it's a soft spot in my heart for the original series. Yeah. Um, but then again, I was when the next generation came on. I was eighteen, and um, the interesting thing is, my wife is definitely not a sci-fi supporter. Yeah, mine neither. <laughs> okay, so we were in a hotel in um, where were we now? I think it was Vancouver or something. And we had Netflix on because the great thing now about TVs at the hotels is you get your net. Your, yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. And uh, I started playing the first episode of the Next Generation, yeah. and she was watching it. And I was going to turn off the next one. She goes, "No, no, no!" So we watched like four episodes of Next Generation. She's starting to get into it now. And she's getting the characters. Yeah. She's uh, yeah, so slowly but surely. You know, a few years from now, she's going to know how to speak Klingon. <laughs> and she already knows more than she yeah. than she. Well, still admit. Yeah, but uh, actually. <laughs> Battlestar, when we first got together, Battlestar Galactica was our, was our thing. I can honestly say I've never seen more than about 30 seconds of anything Battlestar Galactica. What? Just never... You haven't watched the new series? Nothing. I don't actually have cable. Okay. So if it's not on Netflix or Prime, generally now I don't see it. Um, or if it goes into theaters, I might see it. I mean, I have two kids under two. Well, actually, yeah. just a week ago, she's not under two anymore, so I can't really say that, but... Okay. It's either if it's in theaters, I might get a chance to see oh, it. Oh yeah. So or Netflix or Prime. So 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 basically, it, it's she enjoyed because it's not super sci-fi. There's no aliens. Mm-hmm. You know, they're in space and there's you know lasers and stuff. Yeah. But um, it was just it's 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 a cool. So anyway, she was interested. Whereas yeah. Yeah. I could not get her into Blade Runner or you know. Yeah. Which I like actually that. that Blade Runner is another one I haven't seen. Really. And so that, like, so finally, like I mentioned in the Lord one time, I had never seen The Goonies. Yes. Like, four days later in the mail, Tony sent the Blu-ray of yes. The Goonies. Yes, yes. Yeah. Although I have never seen The Goonies either. So I should forward you, or it could be. I but he sent me Never Ending Story. I grew up on that, so okay. I've seen that many right. times. Well, my kids like that. Yeah. That was good. Well, when I was a kid, it was... Like, yeah, so, you know, being in Lord, we get these little <laughs> gifts, yeah. these videos that come in the mail. Yeah. So, yeah. Odd tangent here in the episode. But you know what? The, the point is, yeah. the point is to um, the neat thing about our business, and especially about social media like Facebook, is to get together with common interests. Yeah. Right. Because we have, because our group is like in the states, you know, all over the place, right? Yeah, and like, and you just like if you look at the type of people in it, like it's yeah. all over the place. Yeah. Like the different types and like political leanings and everything like. And we what? know who likes what and all that yeah. and it, yeah. It's just a fun. Yeah. And like I have another similar group, but it's actually just over chat, where we actually entirely bonded over tacos, where we started going to like all you can eat Taco Tuesdays. So the original group was just called Taco Tuesdays, and then long story and turned into the great taco chat. See, I'm going to need to introduce you to Ray Estrella in Vancouver because he's like the taco guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so there you go. Right? Set one up over tacos. Yeah, great yeah, great yeah. networking method. Yeah, yeah. It just works. Yeah. A lot of business is flowing through that group. You know, it's the best, it really is the best business because we can actually uh, implement our, our passions or things that we like. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, where am I going with this? It's like we don't we don't need to be outed, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, there's everyone has. I mean, we know when we go into people's houses, people have certain. You know, they're hockey fans. Yeah. Are they? Uh, man, one of my clients had all the Doctor Who episodes. Wow. 
And I walked, it was a, it was a condo, and I said, you're a Doctor Who fan? And he's like, uh, yes. And I'm like, so am I. Who's your favorite yeah. Doctor? What's your favorite episode? And we had a great, except he, he was hardcore. Because yeah. he had like 1963 to like yesterday. <laughs> yeah, the original. So, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah I was, it's like when I, like I am a Wheel of Time fan, but, and I love the series, but I like met like a Wheel of Time fan one time. You did? But yeah, there was another one. Oh, okay, um, the two of you. We oh, have, we, <laughs> Wheel of Time has outsold Game of Thrones. Okay. But that's only because there's 14 books and we will talk about four. <laughs> so they're going to um, turn this into a series on... Uh, Amazon's picked it up. See, okay. like, showrunner set. Writers are going. Okay. They're literally script, doing scripting out. Writers have been hired. They're going through it all now. Um, but it's going to be a lot different than Game of Thrones because there's a lot of magic, essentially. Okay. I mean, it's not magic in the show, but, it, yeah, there's a lot of magic. So it'll be very weird to see how they translate it. Interesting. And I don't... Every, every fan is... Cautiously optimistic is yeah. the nicest way to say it. Because yeah. I thought this way, and because we love time, Twitter is actually a big thing. Um, everyone's like, we're pretty sure it'd be better as a cartoon. Oh. Just because the shit. I never started. heard of that before. Like I, I read the thread and I'm like, yeah. what the heck is this? Wheel? I gotta check out this wheel of time. It's a great book. Like it is. And so the funny, interesting one, if you're a Game of Thrones fan, which I know you mentioned, you're not. I just haven't had a chance to watch. He, it. Robert Jordan, around the same time as when Game. Um, George R. R. Martin started Game of Thrones, so they actually have references mm. to each other in each of their stories, mm. and they're both influenced heavy by Tolkien. But it's funny because like there's a point where one of the characters, who's named Perrin, Wheel of Time, one of the characters is like you know nothing, Perrin, and that was a direct you know nothing Jon Snow reference. And then there's a few that go back the other way from George R. R. Martin where they reference each other like that. Okay. So it's kind of but the difference is is the Robert Jordan. Yeah. Wrote 14 books and is done. Now, he actually, this is what I was scared about with George R. R. Martin. Robert Jordan died before the end of the series. Oh, right. So there was, th there's supposed to be one more book, yeah. turned into three, because it ended up being, like, each book ended up being 300,000 words. All right. So they, yeah, they ended up doing three books out of it, but yeah, he died before the end, which is everyone, which is what everyone's worried about with. George. George R. R. Martin is, what if he dies before he finishes Game of Thrones? He's not looking like a healthy guy, I guess. And I think he's 70, uh, and at his current pace of writing books, he would be about 98 if he finished at the current pace. Uh, and then people are like, I don't know that that'll happen. Or at least Robert Jordan, he knew it was coming because it was a disease. He actually like wrote down all the notes. And was like, this is what's happening. Here's all the major things that need to be hit. And then they basically just found an author they liked named Brandon Sanderson, who basically just took that, filled in the gaps, stylized it and turned it into three books so actually finished it <laughs> oh, okay. but yeah enough geeking out on that for a bit. but yeah uh, yeah I, I like wheel of time gonna get a tattoo yeah. related um, well, yeah, so you know what we, we were talking about community uh related stuff so uh something that happened to me you know i'm a red dwarf fan i'm a red dwarf yeah. nut right right if anyone who doesn't know red dwarf is a bbc produced yeah. sci-fi <laughs> comedy right who does that um, and it was, it started in 1989 mm -hmm. and I started watching it on the Seattle PBS station, uh, early in the early nineties. Right. Yeah. So like, you know, 1992 or whatever. And I would, you know, you'd binge watch cause that was the original binge watching in those <laughs> days. Right, without the Netflix or whatever. You remember, there's. Do you watch British comedy and stuff like that? I love a lot of it. I, in general, British TV, I just find to be better. Yeah, than what it's, we it's have good here. stuff. But you know, you, you you'd have those like the day of Monty Python, <laughs> or the day of uh, Mr. Bean, or whatever, or, or Blackadder. Yeah, and you just like binge watching was great. So this this Red Dwarf uh, thing came out, and I just loved it because I'm a sci-fi nut, yeah. and it was funny, and it was English. And uh, during the PBS uh, shows, there's always the break, mm -hmm. right? And they ask for money because it's public television. Uh, and the thing about the Seattle station is they had the actors come up. Mm -hmm. So they would have like a Red Dwarf festival. Yeah. They'd have the actors come up. And back then in 1993, I wrote a letter to the PBS station and I said, I would like to be a volunteer on the telephones when the actors come. And I never got a, a call back. <laughs> So fast forward to uh, 2000 and uh, I think it was 2013. Uh, I was uh, having a holiday in Calgary at a down moment. I had nothing to do. I was surfing the internet and I decided to email KCTS9, which is the PBS station in Seattle. 
and I said, um, I used to watch Red Dwarf. Uh, I love PBS because I still do. I watch, you know, uh, PBS stuff. Um, I have a background in media because I was the president of our real estate board. And I would love to come down and be a um, pledge host. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was called back then, but, you know, whatever. Uh, and I send them clips because uh, I save all my yeah. clips, right? I send them clips of my, my news, you know, things in the local news. And the next day I get an email from the station. And Stephen Haig, the producer, goes, you won't believe this. We were just talking about the fact that we need a Canadian pledge host. Yeah. So come down to Seattle, and we'll see if there's something for you. So I went down there. No pay. You know, this is a volunteer job. Seattle's really close to Victoria, so I just went down yeah, it's there. It's giving me a couple hours. Yeah. You know, you jump on a plane, it's like 15 minutes, right? Yeah. Um, and I became, and I still am as of this moment, <laughs> I am the Canadian pledge host for KCTS9. So I've done things like um, uh, Downton Abbey, which is yeah. huge, Foils War, um, uh, Nature, you know, with Attenborough uh, and all that stuff. So they, they bring me down there. And do we do this for, for real estate? Do we for, do it for business? No, you know, that's fun, right? Yeah. But people watch, yeah. right? So I have clients who are like, I see you on PBS all the time. Uh, you know. Uh, now, can you get the original clips of that? Of like, the, like, like the file? From, from the video the, file? From the yeah. Uh, station? Yeah. Yeah. So I actually, the nerdy Facebook marketer side of me is like, let's run ads to that mm -hmm. and then retarget people watching it with real estate ads to hire you. Interesting. Because anyone who watches at least 50% of one of those clips, we target with an ad of book a call about listing your home with Tony Joe. Interesting. And now the nerdy side of me is like, because you have all this great content, you should totally do yeah, that. Ever powerful. Yeah. Because yeah. like, on the marketing side, I was on your website, you have the Facebook pixel on it, yeah. but you're not running any Facebook ads. What? Well, yeah, we do a little bit. So at least on your prime team yes. Facebook page, zero ads are currently running. All right. Because I was checking before, because I'm a nerd and okay. I like Facebook ads. <laughs> So we are doing something a little differently on the side with... Uh, Unbranded? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. But that's a new thing for us, the online lead generation thing. Yeah, so it's interesting, it's like I've tested the unbranded versus the branded a lot. Yeah. Three years ago, there's a little bit more results from an unbranded versus your everyday agent page. Yeah. But what we noticed is now an agent with no like... Footprint? Yeah, yeah, is about the same as an unbranded page Interesting. from results. Interesting. An agent who is known will outperform an unbranded almost every single time. Huh. So I would say it sounds like you're relatively known in your area. Yeah. I would move those ads over to your team page and see how that performs comparatively. Interesting. Yeah. Well, there we go. We come for a reason. Yeah, yeah. done. Yeah. My value is out. <laughs> there we go. There we go. But yeah, no, it's... It's fun because yeah, like, yeah, like the, if you have that good video content, blast it out. And there's lots. Target. Yeah, no, I, I, we, uh, we keep everything. So uh, I actually have a uh, what do you call it? a game capture box. Mm -hmm. You know, so when people are playing the video games, they capture their game. Yeah. So I do that with um, with all the the news clips and stuff that we have. That's awesome. Yeah. So how many hours of footage now do you have? A lot. So keep it on a hard drive. It's yeah. yeah it's it's all. So you got to send it. Find like a guy in Upwork. Send him it all, and you create like the best speaker reel that you've ever existed. All right. Now you're gonna be booked everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so like here's so here's because you're a big big speaker in the Canadian real estate. Well, I don't market. know. Big is the word, but you know, I yeah. Do you? Because like I've talked to speakers who now like. For instance, like if you wanted to, and I don't know if you do, like you could probably charge ten thousand dollars. And there's people who would bring you in to speak for ten thousand. I know another speaker like that from Halifax who could charge that and would, yeah. but he doesn't do it because he knows every time he speaks, he gets three to five referrals out of every talk that he gives. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand at real estate events when you're asked to speak in the terms of looking at like compensation versus what I can get out of talking if I'm not compensated? So that is an interesting question because I'm also an instructor for the British Columbia Real Estate Association. Yeah. So I teach and I get paid to teach. It's not the reason why we do it. Like instructors don't do it for the, you know, yeah. the money is in the grand scheme of things, okay. It's not great relative to real estate, like yeah. the actual job of real estate, right? 
Um, but we enjoy doing it because, you know, we're passionate. We, we, we like educating people, yeah. you know, trying to get the right word out when people are starting up. Um, uh, you know, fashioning these new minds into mm -hmm. into what could be yeah. great real estate people, right? So I, I do get paid to teach, mm -hmm. right? And, I, and as an example, I just had two speaking gigs last month. So I had mm -hmm. one for a Royal LePage office in Vancouver. Wollstonecraft? That's or, right. Yep. Yeah, so they had a, a room of, it was their annual event. And uh, mm -hmm. there was uh, I think about 150 people there. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, you know, they, just, they asked me to come and talk, mm -hmm. and that does come up. It's like, if you come and talk, there's referral opportunities. Yeah. And as it turns out, so that event, I also had my Asian Real Estate Association annual general meeting. Mm -hmm. So it made sense because I was in town anyways, yeah. right? And uh, um, I have, of course, a lot more Facebook uh, connections as a result of that. Yeah. And I think the probability of referrals, especially in a place like Victoria, because a lot of people go to Victoria, is, is really high. So, um, yes, I did that for, mm -hmm. uh, for no pay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just spoke yesterday at Richard Robbins. It was a, it was a 1220 person room. It was a nice room. Yeah. I've heard good things. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so, so I had 30 minutes there. I do that for rich because, uh, you know, the organization has done a lot for me yeah. and, uh, I've spoken for them for, you know, many times, but again, the referral uh, aspect is, is great. Now I have been paid. I've been paid to speak yeah. at uh, uh, at other venues too. I guess it sort of just depends on the situation. On the situation, you know, budget sometimes. I mean, let's face it, a lot of brokers brokerages don't have budget. Yeah, you know, they don't have that five or ten thousand dollar budget or or whatever it is. Um, but there are other ones that do. Yeah, and you know, there's. I mean, you've got a, you've got a speakers uh, a group and everything. There's a lot of value there, yeah. right? So uh, there's there's people there who are who are worth every penny. That, that they charge. So you like you've done the media training, you've done a lot of speaking. If there were because like a lot of agents approach me about like asking how, mm -hmm. how would you say if some like an agent wanted to get into speaking mm -hmm. and doing that side of the business, how would you recommend they get into it? Well, um, first of all, the provincial association has been a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if your association is looking for instructors, um, being qualified and becoming an instructor is a good thing because you're yeah. you're you're kind of forced to be in front of class, right? Yeah. So I do probably about because um, I do both Victoria and Nanaimo. There's two boards. Yep. Yeah. So probably about eight events a year, uh, one day events. Yeah. Uh, for uh, for the boards, and that's you good do the practice. Whole day? Yeah. 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 Because nice. it's 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 applied practice. It's the new yeah. you know the new licensees. So, you know, you know, the other thing that's interesting too is I feel my value as an instructor to the new people is the fact that I have 27 years of history and any question they can ask, I can generally answer. Yeah. Not just from the book, but from an experiential standpoint. So from experiences, what's the weirdest thing ever happened to you on a showing when you've been selling for 27 years? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't really a showing, it was a preview. Mm -hmm. So we were sent, I had mentioned before that when I started real estate, I worked with a partner, yeah. still a good friend of mine. Uh, we were sent to go have a look at a, a waterfront property and we were told to go through the gate and we walked down the gate towards the water and we were going, hey, this is a lovely <laughs> waterfront property. And I turned my head and up on the tier, like the next tier of yeah. uh, landscaping, was this Doberman Pinscher with his ears back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was, I'm a dog person, yeah. so I was fine, but Bonnie, my partner, became co concrete. Yeah. Like she would not move, and uh, yeah, that was that was interesting. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. I haven't walked into someone in the shower yet. Really? No, 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 there's lots of stories like that. Maybe it's our area, because like, I remember when I was selling, and I'd go to my brokerage, because like the first time I saw someone naked during the showing, the first I've, time. Yeah, it's, there's been more than one. Um, I go <laughs> to my office and I'm like, uh, this just happened. I would say 80% of the room had a story about it. Okay. Like they had all like... No, I have never... Like, I have right? never... Mind you, I'm from Victoria, so there's a lot of seniors. So maybe the mm -hmm. naked thing is not a great thing. My guy was... The guy, first guy I saw was probably over 50. Oh, yeah. Like, it's not like it was a young... Oh, yeah. I mean, there was definitely, like, the guy who had, like, the craziest net story was, like, it was an exhibitionist's 
home that they were showing oh, yeah. who wanted to be so he like be on display when people came oh, of course to the point that every time a showing got booked he had to go 15 minutes early to go make her put her clothes on for the showing so oh. anytime a show was booked he had to make sure to go early to make her put her clothes on yes and i was like although i've heard about the naked realtor over here somewhere there's some naked realtor guy so it's a Kijiji or Craigslist ad where this guy is like... But nobody knows who he is. So someone's figured it out because I've okay. seen like the threads where we talked about it. But I don't know that he actually like does business so much as posts ads that he is a oh, okay. generously physiqued individual and willing to show property. With Although what we heart. did have in Victoria recently is we had the, um, the posting and it was... <laughs> It was a house for sale that had a sex dungeon. How do you write that up properly? <laughs> I'm not sure, but it had the yeah. swing. The pictures had like the <laughs> swing and everything, right? Like you, you almost got to offer it with a professional cleaner. Like I'm not sure how. Wipes. Like, yeah, like Wipes. something yeah. there in the closing condition, like yeah. this will be sterilized and then never used between sterilization and closing. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that'd be an interesting marketing job. Yeah, so it was posted, I guess it was posted on, uh, you know, yeah. a, a new to site or something. So there's screen captures everywhere. But then realtors are showing this house and they go, have you seen the sex <laughs> dungeon down yeah. there? Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. I think the coolest home I ever saw had like full hockey rink in it. So the yeah. guy turned out he actually sold like the coolers for hockey rinks. Yeah. So he built one with these 12 ton coolers that even here like an actual actual ice Yeah, that really? 12 or 10 of the 12 months of the year in Ontario Could have a full hockey rink outdoors. That's, that's hard so like yeah. only July and August could he not keep a full hockey rink out but right. like June he'd still have a hockey rink out Yeah but that was literally his company's job. So he had these massive coolers in there and well from the geek realm, you know what I mean yeah. we get to see some fun geeky stuff yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've seen some interesting ones, like, geeky in a different way, but with sports, where, like, a guy was clearly a massive Green Bay Packers fan, yeah. had life-size, like, statue of Brett Favre, and, like, everything. I think there was at least 15 different signed and framed Packers jerseys around the walls, and, you know, there's some... People have their passions. It's an interesting side of the business of, like, seeing how people... Yeah, but it's another... Con it's a conversation about staging, though, too, right? Yeah. Because the thing about the, the West Coast, and maybe it's the same other places, too, is, you know, the hunting. You know, it's like the uh, the prizes, you know, mm -hmm. the uh, um, the stuff heads... And heads on the wall, yeah. Yeah, it's not, not for everyone. It's true, because, yeah, some areas that would help. Yeah. Other areas that will destroy it. Like, yeah. I remember I showed one, and our the buyer I had actually freaked out and left. Is because they not only stuffed their old dog, yeah, they stuffed it in a way that it looked like it was just sleeping next to the fireplace. So, and we all thought it was a real dog at first, yeah. and it just freaked my wife out, and she left. She couldn't come back in. She was just like, "Nope, I'm out. I'm done." We never looked at the house again, but she just couldn't handle this because their regular dog, the one that was alive, was also there, and we're like, the "How big a dog was this?" It was a little one. Yeah, yeah it wasn't. It was probably like a twenty pound. So I, I'll tell. I'll, that's an interesting story. I'll tell you this though. My uh, our Dalmatian passed away this mm -hmm. year. My wife found a website where you send pictures of the dog, yeah. and they created the stuffy, mm -hmm. which is clearly a stuffy. It's yeah. not like you know. It's not like a, a yeah. taxidermied, yeah. Um, you know, Stephanie Arnold special. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it mangled rat. That's right. <laughs> and uh, uh, which apparently is in a guest room or something. I hear right. Uh, in Vancouver, or Hawaii. <laughs> in, uh, so it would they create this stuffed animal yeah. dog, and our Dalmatian has very specific markings, and it is it, it's, it's, I mean, it was expensive, but it was beautiful. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And the kid loves it. Yeah. Well, that's like well, not only not that I'm talking about that side, but like she's a very unique dog, like the blue eyes, the mm -hmm. markings, and we're like, mm -hmm. we could never just get a similar dog. Yeah. So we're like, but we, I don't want to stuff. <laughs> like, I am not I'll a... I'll send you the link. Yeah. It's, <laughs> that yeah, would yeah. be much better. Yeah, yeah. It would be got like, the paws are painted and yeah. stuff. And yeah, yeah. yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah. But yeah, definitely send that and we'll get one. But we'll to, yeah, hopefully Wait. it's like 10 years yes. plus until yeah. that's a thing. Um, so for you now, like, so you're involved a lot in real estate. You're involved a lot in the community. You're Richard Robbins. Oh, so we didn't talk too much about, like, why did you decide 
to get into coaching on top of everything you're doing. Oh yeah. So that came that came later. I, I started up with Richard Robbins as a coaching client in 2003. Mm -hmm. So I had uh, I was coached and I was in a master's group. They have groups now too. Um, but what happened was I became the president of our board in 2008, and I had, and I stepped out because yeah. I said you know what I'll be busy for the year. I, there's no way I can commit to you know the book assignments and yeah. uh, you know all that kind of stuff. So I took a break from Richard Robbins, ended up doing my um, my real estate stuff, ended up being the com the community committee stuff. And, you know, we always stayed in touch. I would yeah. go to Richard Robbins events and, and all that. But I got asked to speak. So Sue reached out to me and asked me to speak. Um, I think it was in Vancouver. Sue is Sue Robbins. Wife. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mrs. Richard Robbins. Mm -hmm. And I ended up uh, doing a presentation I'm going to say it was about 2013. Mm. So I sort of got on the speaker circuit. Um, I actually, my first speaking job was with Richard Robbins in 2008. Yeah. Two, I'm sorry, 2007. It was 2007. the same. Yeah. Ten, so 10 years of speaking. Yeah, yeah so it was 2007. And um, I did this talk, which I still do today, which is about maintaining your value and saving okay. your commission. I have heard that talk. Okay. It's awesome. Thank you. That was a well done talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, he, he at the time, was experimenting, so we were a breakout. Mm -hmm. So the general room was there in Vancouver. I had a room upstairs. It was, it was 200 people. So my yeah. first speaking gig was 200 people. Yeah. And, uh, and it was great. Um, but fast forward, uh, still more speaking events uh, for Rich and for Sue. Uh, and then uh, they, needed, they were looking for another coach. So I've been coaching with them for four years now. How do you like that? Uh, it is fulfilling. Yeah, it's fulfilling. Um, uh, so the organization, almost all the coaches are full-time coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of us that are realtors that are coaches, and I guess they just they they fit people where they need. You know, maybe it's yeah. a practicing realtor is is. Uh, I, I find being a practicing realtor is is important for speaking for me. You know, yeah. for speaking and 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 for things like that. Well, I found that like when I was a trainer is like for like the first four or five months as a trainer. It worked because it was still stuff that I had just done. Yeah. But I'm teaching on technology. Yeah. Six months, it gets old fast. No yeah. And that was a spat like four years ago was when things were changing fast, yeah. like, even faster than they were now. And yeah. after, again, like when I remember on six, I'm like, at this point, I'm just going to regurgitate what other people have said. Yeah. Like it's you can't it's the thing about tech, talk yeah. from experience. Yeah. yeah. Whereas like that's what I like now. What I do is like I'm like here's what we're doing today. It's going to be different tomorrow. Yeah. Like. Yeah. If it changes tomorrow, my presentation the day after, I'll change it and update it based on what we actually learn. Whereas if I was like, been a speaker for five years and hadn't done any of this, I'd be like, well, five years ago on Facebook ads, <laughs> this is what worked. Well, I find it interesting, you know, because I, I talked about uh, buy representation yesterday. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so many, it resonated with so many people. But yeah. it's a classic example because I've been doing that for 11 years. Yeah. Right? And, and it's funny because I guess it really depends on where the person is at the time. No. You know, where they're at at that moment. If they're if they're ready for tech, not everyone's ready for tech, right? But the ones who are, I mean, that's why you're around, right? So, do you find when you're coaching that, like, do you ever get stuff out of it that you can implement in your business? Like, you're coaching someone else and learning from them at all? Like, is it entirely a one way street? Um, I wouldn't say that I have received anything um, um, noteworthy from coaching mm -hmm. clients. Yeah. But what the coaching does, for instance, business planning, right? Yeah. So I'm on my guys the end of October, early November, let's get business planning done for January the 1st. Yeah. And so when, when I'm doing that with them, it's like, I gotta, get, I gotta do that for myself, yeah. right? So it's, it's like self-accountability as a result of being accountable for, for other people. So how much effort, if any, do you put into like, so you have the prime team, which is the name of your team in Victoria. Yep. And then there's like, essentially the Tony Joe personal brand. Yeah. How much time do you put into building the Tony Joe side of? Yeah, so that, that it was a decision that we made a couple years ago. The, the, we developed the prime team because it was Tony Joe and associates for years. Yeah. And in Victoria, I was the first and associates, but of course everybody now is an associates. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was novel at the time, but it, it ran thin uh, after a while. And part of it is the whole succession plan as well. Because it is hard to sell a business with your name on it. Yeah. In the real estate business anyways, where really it's all about connections, right? And uh, we decided to, to uh, choose this brand. Yeah. 
and um, you know, our our team is tight and coherent, like right now. When it comes time to grow further, because I like a small team. I've got three yeah. licenses. I don't right now. I don't want thirty people. I don't think I'll ever want thirty people. Right. But if at some point in time the team did decide it wanted to grow, it is easier, in my estimation, to have it as the prime real estate team, yeah. as opposed to you know. Well, it's interesting because like, look at Richard Silver as an example. He was Torontoism, yeah, and he's actually switched now to Silver Burtnick and Associates. Yes, yeah. and his reasoning was, we'll treat it like a law firm where mm -hmm. we'll be Silver Burtnick and Associates, but say like hypothetically you moved to Toronto and joined his team, it'd be Silver Burtnick and Joe and Associates, like a name partner. He's like, then it's easier to drop me out and get bought out than becomes Burtnick and Joe Associates or something like that. But it's a tough, well, anyway, like it's, so so the interesting thing anyone who's had a team for long enough realizes that the consumer comes back based on the experience yeah and based on how they were handled and in many ways it doesn't matter who who did the deal so you know one of the things that people often struggle about when they're thinking about having a buyer agent I, I had the first buyer agent in Victoria mm -hmm. and and most people are like well if the buyer bought the house with a buyer agent when it comes time for them to sell who are they gonna call mm -hmm. right and my buyer agent, after she was fantastic, after three years, decided that she wanted to retire from real estate. Um, when she left, I, I had that question. But then people started calling and saying, Lynn helped, you know, helped us buy, but I know she's not in the business anymore, so we need you because we're selling and we're moving again. Yeah. And it reminded me that it was all about the process. It's all about the process and the system and the experience. Right? So how much effort and planning do you put into the customer experience side? Because like most agents you talk to, is on the, I need to generate more leads, close yeah. the leads, lead gen conversion is the majority, like 90% of the conversations out there. Yeah. But I think for long-term success, it's the experience of the clients yeah. that matters. Like, what do you guys do to make that experience? So we have our operations manager, by the name of Sonia Jones, who is the backbone of our organization. Yeah. Sonia came from the real estate board, so she went as far up as she could in customer service. Yeah. At the real estate board, we asked her to join us, and she did, and she's fantastic. The best thing about having Sonia is she knows the business. She yeah. knew the business. She knew the people. She knew you know most of the agents in Victoria. That was six years ago now, so yeah. things have changed. Um, but she's the person that we have just said, you know, any touches that the consumer has, yeah. that's your role, right? When it comes to um, closing gifts, when it comes to, um, you know, something that she implemented a number of years ago. This one still baffles me. We send people after they move in a uh, packet of popping corn mm -hmm. with a little note on it. And I get phone calls from people like six months later saying, the popcorn was great. <laughs> and that was not my idea. Like I yeah. wouldn't, I, I, probably I would not have implemented that, but she thought this is a great idea and boom, as a result, it, yeah. it works, right? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So getting, the, getting that right person. So how do you go about finding the right people to join your team? I've been very fortunate because most of the time people come and, and approach me. Yeah. Uh, by, I didn't have a chance to talk about this yesterday at Richard Robbins about the buyer representation agreement. You know, we put together a buyer presentation. So we explain the process. Uh, ultimately, it ends up to the point where a, um, the, the consumer decides if they want to hire us. Yeah. Sign a buyer representation agreement. Um, I've had one of my agents who's not with, with me now, I haven't had a ton of turnover, right? But, yeah. but these are just some examples. Um, he joined because he wanted his hands on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I love this thing. I want to be part of this. And okay, well, here we are. So when someone like joins, yep. do you like have the conversation of like, do you want to stay long term? Are you doing this for like a training period? Because like one of the big things people tell people to join the industry now is join a team for a couple of years, learn, and then go off on your own. Yeah, I was fortunate. I was fortunate because early earlier on, so it was two thousand and seven. I had a fellow who was a newbie, last newbie I would probably ever hire. Yeah, and it was pretty clear that was his intent was to learn what he could and move. Yeah. And uh, he stayed with us for I think it was about three months, and he didn't make a sale. But it was expensive because we had changed, we had changed our, you know, some of our marketing pieces and stuff yeah. like that. And I, uh, I, I don't regret it because you know we learn, right? I won't do that again. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, Angie's been with me now for, I think it's 11 years. She was on another team. I've known her. So my business partner from way back then in the old days, yeah. her daughter is best friends with Angie. So I've known Angie since, since she was 16. When she left the other uh, uh, team, she came to me and she's, you know, she, it's a family. We're a tribe, right? So uh, there's that. Uh, Kyle came from another team. Uh, when he was new in the business, uh, he signed a five-year agreement with a, uh, a mm -hmm. team leader that, that uh, he doesn't regret it. I mean, it was good for him, yeah. but he knew he wasn't going to stay there forever. And, uh, and then he joined us afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it all sort of happens, right? That's awesome. So how, what's the total size of your team now? So three licensees yeah. uh, and two and a half admin. So you just got like a part time. Yeah. So Talon uh, works two two and a bit days a week. So she's actually the operation manager's assistant. So the assistant has an assistant. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she's doing good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Sonya's great. I mean, she's she can do 150 transactions in a year. Yeah. You know, she does the, the listings, the uh, uh, the the sale paperwork and stuff like that. But when you get busy like that, then it's you. She started losing the. Uh, the the anniversary cards, the birthday cards, and all that stuff. Yeah. So that's what Talon comes in, and she takes care of all that kind of stuff. And right now, Sonia is in Egypt, so she's off for a month. That's nice. Yes, but <laughs> yeah. since Talon has been with us for a year, and she knows all the systems, yeah, and she's there, so Talon stepped in for the month, and you know we're we're good. So as the team leader, with everything you're doing, like you one of the more full plates in the industry, of how much do you actually sell these days? So I am still the principal listing agent in our team. Yeah. So Kyle, who joined us three years ago, he's the president of the real estate board right now. He does take he does take listings. Yeah. Um, but I I am a listing agent. Yep. So whenever one of my sellers sells and has to buy, Angie takes care of that because she's a one hundred percent buyer agent. Yeah. Uh, for a buyer agent, that's the best kind of lead to have because it's somebody who needs to find a place to buy, <laughs> right? And and they're qualified. Um, I, so I haven't done the count this year yet. I know last year I was gone for 96 days and the year before, which was my biggest year, I was gone for 112. Yeah. yeah. You know, just coming over and doing stuff like this, right? Um, I, I, I like this. This, this fulfills me, right? It does double duty because I, I get to hang out with people, you know, meet new people and all that. Uh, but I know that the team is functioning uh, with me, yeah. right? And even right now as a listing agent, I was able to do a sale yesterday. Just on in the conference, there that often. <laughs> yeah, because you know you're you're yeah. on your phone or you're on your iPad or whatever, and um, and and we can do that, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's just good to have that 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 whole the background all set up and everything. So, how do you manage your time with all these things going on uh -huh. to actually fulfill all the different obligations that you have? We haven't talked about family yet, right? Because sure. you have a young family. Yep. Right, so I've got Which a, is a struggle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a six-year-old. I got an eight-year-old. Yeah. Uh, my wife, um, she, she actually, she just hung up her license a month ago. So she's been licensed for uh, I think it's thirteen years. Uh, the re she hasn't been selling since we had our kid, our kids. Yeah. Right, because we've wanted we've wanted to be home, right? And uh, she's now a coach for Richard Robbins, mm -hmm. so she's doing that. Uh, she's great. She's like the best buyer agent ever. So when it comes to buyer agency, like she, she was great, uh, but it's all about the scheduling, right? So, I mean, we know well out in advance. I know the Banff Western connection is the end of January. I know Banff uh, Remax is going to be October. I know uh, recharge is going to be here again, roughly, you know, September or whatever, right? So we, we put that in the calendar. Right, and then the other thing too is when it comes to boards, like uh, community boards and everything, they usually lay out their their meeting schedule a year in advance. So I yeah. know, right, um, when meetings will happen. So I schedule all those in the schedule, yeah, and then everything else kind of comes in afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so. it's a tough, especially with kids, because like even like now, granted, mine don't have it yet, but like I look at my brother, like every night of the week, it's <laughs> dance and basketball and yeah. soccer and all these different things. Like, do you block out, like, these are the must-haves, no matter what's happening with work, like, yeah. these I have to attend? Yeah, so so there's a lot of things. So, again, as a listing agent, uh, generally speaking, evenings and weekends, I have pretty free. Yeah. Uh, and most of the work that I do happens after the kids go to bed, because I like putting them in bed. I like being there, you know. They're at that kind of fun age, right? Yeah. Um, and I like spending time on weekends. Sunday is Doctor Who Day. <laughs> 
right? Because the new like doctor, a female doctor. I'm actually very happy yeah. with her. Yeah, yeah. I like the storylines. I like it's, it's very inclusive. It's very yeah. ethnic, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's been great. My son loves it. So my son, who's eight now, he's more of a he's he's the house Doctor Who fan. Yeah. So he know he's a he's a David Tennant guy. <laughs> um, but um, you know, I just I, I I like that storytelling just because it's yeah. it's you know it's it's good stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. But I, but I want to be home. Uh, I love conferences, which are usually during the week. Yep. Because I know I go home and I get to spend the weekend with the kids. Um, it's a band plus connection, isn't it? Over a weekend. I guess it's it like probably a Thursday to Sunday or yeah. something not too like many that. are though, right? Like yeah. they're usually they're usually during the week. Yeah, it always throws me off when I see the dates and it's like I think they're Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's bowling cool. night. It's bowling yeah. night. <laughs> um, but it's it's all scheduling, and I gotta say, I was not. This did not come naturally for me. I was really yeah. bad with time. In fact, uh, my Rotary Club, I mentioned that I was a, um, a founding member of our Rotary Club. We had the Tony Joe Award. <laughs> and that was for the last person that walked into the <laughs> meeting. Because I was uh, perpetually late, right? Um, I, I could never keep a schedule. Uh, but it has changed. Because, you know, things force you to... Yeah, when you have so many organize. things going. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then... One of the other boards. So I sat on the Anna Wim Companions House uh, board, which I loved. And that was a, it's basically a halfway house. It's a transition yeah. house. Uh, houses seven men uh, outside of the government realm. Mm -hmm. uh, it fed about 40 people. It feeds about 40 people for lunch. It provides showers and uh, clothes washing for people throughout the day. Uh, I love that organization. I'm still involved. But I missed almost every board meeting for a year. Yeah. So I didn't deserve to be there. Right? Yeah. But I'm here, you know, if they need something, they call. It's all about being the, the connection, right? Because the, the thing that realtors used to be in the community, which are not so much nowadays anymore, is we used to be part of the fabric of the society. Mm -hmm. You go to the Rotary Clubs, you go to the Lions Clubs or Kiwanis or whatever, there's always the guy. Who's the guy that knows everyone? Yeah. Right? Uh, was it the lawyer? Probably not. Was it the accountant? Probably not. There's the real estate person. Well, that's what I noticed the first, so when I started my business, I had that idea of like, do I stick working with real estate agents or do I start taking on like local businesses around here too? Yeah. And I remember the first like Aurora Chamber of Commerce event I went to, there was about My 80, daughter's name is Aurora, by the way. She's moved to Aurora. There we go. <laughs> yes. There's just 80 entrepreneurs in a room and some of them doing very well, not a single real estate agent. Yeah. And but I'm like, there's a reason. There's a reason. It's because, you know, in the past 20 years, realtors got busy and they didn't feel that they needed to be involved in the community. Yeah. And I tell people all the time, uh, realtors, that it is it is a fantastic opportunity yeah. to get involved in chamber or things like that because there are no other realtors there. But the key is you cannot expect quick payoff. Yeah, it's You've a got to invest. Yeah. yeah, it's a long game. But it's the same like what I'm essentially trying to do with my business in the real estate industry is essentially... Like it's not a local community, it's a North American and even global to an extent of just immersing myself in the community. Like if I went back to sales, I would do the same thing I'm doing for my business now targeting agents. Yeah. Locally. Yeah. Like I'd do over a pint, but I would just do it with local businesses. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't feel like I would do it any differently. Yeah. But it works. <laughs> No, very, very interesting. So are you still like, so if someone wanted to like bring you in as their coach, are you available just like if they reach out to you to have you coach them? Well, I, I do work with the Richard Robinson's organization yeah. and, it, and it, there's great systems there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always, I always direct people to talk to uh, the yeah. gang at Richard Robbins. And if they put us together, that's great. Um, but there might be a, another person who's a better coach for them, right? Okay. Yeah. Personalities are really important. Right? So if people want to get a hold of you, learn more about you, how do they get a hold of you? Um, well, as Keith Roy says, if you if you can't find me on Google, I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah. Except for the fact that Tony Joe, when Seems you Google, like a pretty common name. <laughs> it's not when you when you Google Tony Joe. There's a country singer by the name of Tony Joe White who just passed away. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of articles. There's a lot of Tony yeah, Joe White down. there, but uh, yeah, Tony Joe Victoria or Tony Joe Remax. Uh, I am yeah. right there. Yeah. Sounds good. I really appreciate you making the trek up here yes. and joining on. That was a lot of fun. Anytime. That, you know what? I gotta say that it I would probably pick that up. Well, there you go. Yes, so, it's not bad. Wiser is old fashioned. Not Facebook is not an ad. We're just saying it's a very good drink. Yes. So this will be approved by and your it, advertising and a pinch, it works. It works. Yeah. Right, yeah. But we will also accept your money, JP Wiser's, if you want. <laughs>
Thanks, thanks for coming on. All right.